Great. Well, good morning. And I also understand that we have some national news outlets with us. So good afternoon to those of you who are on the East Coast. My name is Shamia Fagan. I use she, her pronouns, and I am honored to serve as Oregon's 28th Secretary of State. I'm joined today, albeit virtually, by our elections director, Lydia Scroggins, and sorry, Deborah Scroggins, and our compliance specialist who worked on this filing, Lydia Plukchi. And Lydia has been with the agency for almost 20 years. As your Secretary of State, my top priority is to build trust with Oregonians, especially trust in our elections. It's not lost on me that today is one year since there was a violent attack at the United States Capitol. And we're only a few weeks away or a few weeks past the one year anniversary of an attack on the Oregon Capitol. While I've served as Secretary of State over the past year, it's been in the midst of an unprecedented attacks on our democracy, historic distrust in public services, and a scourge of misinformation and false accusations against the local elections officials who make our democracy work every day. Today, Oregon's elections officials disqualified Mr. Kristoff's filing for governor because they determined that he will not have been an Oregon resident for three years before the November 2022 general election, as required by the Oregon Constitution. The Elections Division followed their regular procedure in evaluating candidates for office. The begin, they began that step with a step that all Oregon election officials start with, which is consulting the online central voter registration database in Oregon, and as they do in all cases, when residency or eligibility is in question, the Elections Division then gave Mr. Kristoff's attorneys ample opportunity to provide documentation or information to prove his Oregon residency. The division then consulted repeatedly with the Department of Justice, and they issued their decision. The same kind of decision they issue hundreds of times every election. Let me be clear. I stand by their decision. I agree with their decision, and I will defend their decision. Without putting you to sleep with legal doctrines and which law dictionary was in vogue in 1857, let me walk you briefly through some of the objective facts that the elections officials used to make their decision. Until late 2020 or early 2021, Mr. Kristoff lived in New York and has for the past 20 years. When Mr. Kristoff was traveling for work or vacation, he would repeatedly return to his New York residence. Mr. Kristoff maintained a driver's license in New York for 20 years. Until recently, he was employed in New York. He received his mail at his New York address. He filed income taxes in New York. And perhaps most importantly, Mr. Kristoff voted as a resident of New York for 20 years, including, and this is important, as recently as November of 2020. Ms. Plucci asked Mr. Kristoff for additional information or documents to overcome the strong evidence that taken together shows that until late 2020 or early 2021, Mr. Kristoff considered himself a resident of New York. In response, Mr. Kristoff provided a variety of sentiments and statements that he's made over the years, which we expect are genuine sentiments about his love for Oregon, that he considers Oregon home, and his desire to someday return to Oregon. He talked about his visits to and connection with the family farm in Yamhill County, renovations to the family farmhouse, and his affiliation with a recent LLC operating there. Mr. Kristoff also said that he filed income taxes in Oregon in 2019 and 2020, but he didn't provide any documentation whatsoever, and he didn't even claim that he'd filed those taxes as an Oregon resident. While I have no doubt that Mr. Kristoff's sentiments and feelings towards Oregon are genuine and sincere, they are simply dwarfed by the mountains of objective evidence that until recently he considered himself a New York resident. And it is worth noting, particularly for those of you who are not as familiar with Oregon as our Oregon media, that Oregon's system of vote by mail makes it exceptionally easy for an Oregon resident to receive their ballot out of state and has since we became the first state to use vote by mail in 1998. In fact, that's what thousands of Oregonians do every election, whether they are temporarily serving overseas, whether they're in college, 
whether they're out of state caring for a loved one, uh, whether they are unfortunately displaced by a wildfire or other natural disaster. Any Oregon resident who won't be home during the election to receive their ballot can simply go on OregonVotes.org, update their voter registration mailing address, and your county clerk will make sure that your ballot arrives literally anywhere on the globe. So while this case has clearly garnered significant public interest, in the end, our elections officials told me it wasn't even a close call. And while there have been creative legal arguments and an impressive PR campaign, given the evidence, I venture that most Oregonians who are paying attention have reached the same conclusion. Look, to find that Mr. Kristoff meets the three-year constitutional residency requirement for Oregon governor, while for 20 years living, working, raising his kids, holding a driver's license, filing taxes, and voting as a New York resident until a year ago, just doesn't pass the smell test. As I said before, my top priority is building trust with Oregonians. And we build trust by applying the same rules to everybody. The same rules to someone famous as to someone who's not. The same rules to someone in my political party as someone who's not. The same rules for someone who's raised millions of dollars as someone who has raised none. No exceptions, no special treatment, The rules are the rules for everybody. In fact, you might find it interesting, at least I did, that Mr. Kristoff's filing is just one of 11 that our elections division has had to disqualify just in the past year for not qualifying for the office that they seek, including six other candidates for Oregon governor in 2022 who didn't meet the requirements for the ballot. Let that sink in. In other words, Mr. Kristoff is the seventh candidate for governor that the elections division had to disqualify in the past year because of failure to meet the minimum qualifications for the office. So let's be clear. This hasn't attracted such big media attention because disqualifying a candidate somehow robs Oregonians of a choice. It doesn't. This hasn't attracted attention because candidate qualifications are somehow in conflict with our deeply held, deeply held Oregon values of open, inclusive, and accessible democracy. This is drawing a lot of attention only because one of the candidates disqualified today is named Nicholas Kristoff. But regardless of public attention, the professionals in the Oregon Secretary of State's office know that the rules are the rules for everybody. I wanna thank the hardworking professionals in the elections division for their prompt attention and dedication to this matter. And I wanna thank the election officials all over our country for the hard work they do to protect the integrity of our elections and make our democracy work every day. Thank you for your attention. Bring on your questions. Molly, you're on mute. Of course I'm on mute. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Um, We um, are going to take questions, take as many as we can. Um, I know the Secretary is eager to to talk with you all. Um, Let's um, start with a couple in the chat. Raise your hand also if you want to ask questions. But um, uh, since Gary was very um, eager in the beginning, let's start with his question, um, which is, can the Secretary of State decision be challenged in federal court if the Oregon Supreme Court upholds? And I don't know if we know the answer to that, but... Should we get back to Gary or do we know? I don't know the answer to that. What I do know is that Mr. Kristoff has been given his appeal rights on this decision in an Oregon court and that we are very, very committed to working with his attorneys to make sure that we can do everything we can to get this before the Oregon Supreme Court as quickly as possible. We have a March 17th deadline when we have to give the ballot information to our 36 county clerks so they can begin printing ballots for our overseas and UOCAVA ballots. Great. Just a couple more from the chat that are kind of more logistics. Um, So uh, we've got Angelina Dixon from KVAL 13 in Eugene. Um, She would like to know, will over a million dollars be returned to donors that was raised? That's a question for Mr. Kristoff's campaign. Great. And then um, uh, Mr. Nigel Jaquist from Willamette Week is asking, will the Secretary of State release the DOJ opinion that undermines today's decision? 
So we had repeated verbal conversations with the Department of Justice, as you have reported. And I think actually, Nigel, I think you reported this as well. I know OPB and others did. Uh, we were very anxious. The Elections Division raised the concern back in December that we were very worried about this March election, this printing deadline for the ballots. And so the Department of Justice process, I am learning as a new secretary, is very long to get to a written opinion. And so we said, let's just, you know, they gave us their, their you know, we had verbal discussions. We're very confident that they're going to defend this decision. And, uh, and so we moved forward with that without a written decision because we didn't want to take the additional weeks potentially to get that, which may have made the case hard to get resolved before March 17th when our clerks began pre printing ballots. Great. Um, we're going to take some questions from folks raising their hands. Um, hopefully I'm doing this right. Um, Dylan Mullen, I believe you are unmuted. Hey, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Dylan Mullen. I'm a reporter with the Pamplin Media Group. Um, I'm wondering, it looks like Christoph um, fought, tried to file his candidacy, at least on your website, it says December 20th, 2021. But he had started a pack and announced his run to the media earlier this fall in October. So I'm just wondering the election board investigation into the, le the legitimacy of his candidacy. Had you been doing that for months now looking into his background or did you not initiate that until he filed um, last month? It was really important to Lydia Plucci, again, who's been with the office for almost 20 years, to do this in the regular course, which means that until Mr. Kristoff filed and provided initial information, there was nothing for us to do. And so when he filed, I believe you're right, I think it was December 20th, um, she promptly, I think within a day or so, the, the records are out there, responded to him with questions, noting that she had looked the, at the online central voter registration database, couldn't find any registration information for him, noted that, of course, it had been reported in the Willamette Week and other places that he had issued a legal memo uh, detailing that he had admitting that he had voted and lived in New York. And so she asked, asked for that information. But given that it was during the holidays, she wanted to make sure he had ample opportunity. She requested that information back. I believe, Lydia, you're on here. Was it January 3rd? That is correct. But that was January okay. 3rd. Yes. And then uh, and then the information was then evaluated by Ms. Lucci and the Department of Justice. And I believe we saw the decision come through yesterday. Is that right, Lydia? OK, that's correct. Got it. Thank you. Great, um, Gary, um, you've got your hand up here um, and I believe you are unmuted. Um, anything in addition to asking for us to follow up on the Supreme Court question? I'm going to lower your hand then. Um, I've got Ben Kamisar from NBC. Yes, hi. Uh, thanks for um, doing this with us. I just had a you know, quick question. Obviously, it's no secret that uh, Mr. Kristoff has spent a lot of time in New York. It's part of his campaign story. It's not anything he was hiding. I guess, could you explain a little bit you know, perhaps maybe what sort of actions he could have taken in the eyes of the elections division over these last three years to actually be considered an Oregon resident while spending significant time in New York? I guess, like, is there a line where you can kind of straddle that and still be considered an Oregon resident? Or was his significant time and work in New York just sort of a non-starter in the eyes of the, of the office? Thanks, Ben. It's nice to meet you. So the the law, as it was advised to us, is that you look at all of the circumstances together. It's not one factor that's controlling. However, the, the cases are pretty clear that voting, while not conclusive, is strong presumptive evidence that someone intends to be a resident of a place. So certainly, having registered to vote in Yamhill County uh, prior to November of 2019, I don't know that you know it would have to be evaluated with all the other factors. But as I as I indicated, there were just a mountain of objectives objective factors indicating that his that his own objective intent as demonstrated was to was to be a resident of New York the factors taken together as i mentioned were just overwhelming voting would have been a good start um, but again without knowing more i can't know all of the factors that would have been in play there again lydia would have had to evaluate those factors um, but there, the voting is strong presumptive evidence in the courts that is the place that you intend to make your residence that's very helpful thank you Great, we're going to go to some questions in the chat um, and we'll just kind of go back and forth. Um, so we have a question from Les Seitz with um, the Oregon 
Capital Chronicle, I believe. Les can correct me um, if I'm wrong in the chat. Um, uh, did the Elections Division specifically request any document from Mr. Kristoff, such as task, tax returns? So uh, the, I believe that Lydia's letter is in the public record. It's, it's kind of a standard letter. Again, this is a decisions that she that she's made, you know, many many times a year, every election cycle. I believe that she gave a category of types of documents that could support it. But again, it's you know anything you want to provide, Lydia. I don't know if you want to provide any more information on that. I don't have your letter in front of me. I did not ask for any specific document. Um, I just asked for any documents that Mr. Christoph wanted to provide to prove that he lived here in Oregon three years prior to the election. So I kind of left it up to uh, Mr. Christoph and his campaign to provide any document that they think would prove um, that he lived here. So I did not specify any particular document. Thanks, Lydia. Um, another question from the chat from Gabby Urenda um, with Coin6 News um, asking any indication if he plans to appeal. I have not spoken with him. I know that the, there's been a professional relationship between the attorneys and that we did indicate to him through a call today, again, through the attorneys, not me personally, that we would make every effort to work with them cooperatively to get this before the Oregon Supreme Court as quickly as possible so the decision can be issued before March 17th when the clerks start printing our ballots. Great. So now we're going to go to Dick, um, maybe Dick Hughes, I'm not sure. Um, I believe you are unmuted, Dick. Thank you very much. I apologize if my name is not showing up correctly in this virtual world. Thank you very much for doing this. Um, Madam Secretary, my main question is the, and I don't know if it's for you or for, for Lydia. Um, my main question is, I understand that he submitted new docu new information early in the week. Uh, today's Thursday. Um, I'm, you said that you didn't have time to wait for a DOJ opinion, but it seems like a very quick turnaround from getting his documents to making that decision, which raises the question of whether there was enough scrutiny of what he presented, or was what he presented pretty much a reiteration of what had been presented before. That's a convoluted question, but I th but I think you get where I'm going. No problem, Dick, I've got it. Let me give kind of a general answer and Lydia, please pipe up if there's something more specific. First off, again, we did get advice. She did get advice from the Department of Justice, right? Um, they just, there was a matter of like, oh, to get the legal opinion, it's this whole process. And again, we're worried about timeline. We don't want to be the reason for any of the delays because we made it so clear back in uh, December to the Kristoff campaign that the elections division was concerned about this printing deadline uh, to make sure that Oregonians can trust that their ballots are accurate when they get them this May. And so um, the 100 plus pages or so that Mr. Kristoff provided, his attorney provided on Monday, a lot of it was like articles that had already been in the news, um, op-eds that had been written. I think there may have been a, an affidavit from him it really wasn't any new factual information, but Lydia, you know, please, I don't want to put words in your mouth. No, I agree. Um, the document um, did um, have information that was either already reported in the news um, or the articles that we have seen. And so um, we reviewed the information. We talked to um, Attorney General's office. Um, we had a um, couple meetings about this uh, and we were worried about the deadline. So we wanted to move this quickly. Great, we're going to do one more question um, in uh, from uh, Maggie Vespa with KGW, and then we will go to back to questions in the chat. Maggie, you should be unmuted. Ah, yeah, thank you guys again very much for doing this. Secretary, thank you. Uh, can I ask you more about your comment about, um, you said quickly that you were surprised to learn how many candidates for multiple offices were being disqualified and that there were six other gubernatorial candidates. Can you elaborate on that? Um, just any more with maybe context as to how, whether that is high um, historically or any common factors you're seeing. I think that will surprise a lot of our viewers. Sure, and hi Maggie, and I saw on Twitter that you weren't feeling well until recently, so I'm glad you're back and feeling better. 
Uh, Lydia can provide more information. She's literally been with the agency uh, for 19 years, almost 20. She wouldn't let me say 20 because she's a stickler for details, but almost 20 years. Um, I was surprised, but what she told me was that every election cycle, and I'm sure that our county clerks and local municipal elections officials would say the same, people file and for a variety of reasons don't meet the minimum qualifications for the filing of the office. And so I was, I was, I just happened to ask her, I think it was yesterday, like, is this common? Because she made the decision yesterday and she said, and I said, does it happen under previous secretaries? And she said, with 100% confidence, it happens under previous secretaries. So um, Lydia, you can provide if this is a high number, a low number. Number. Of course, everybody, not just Mr. Kristoff, everybody that is disqualified has those opportunities for appeal rights. We just obviously haven't heard about those um, because, you know, there are people that are not as well known. Lydia, do you want to answer her question about if this historically is a lot or a little? Yeah, it is definitely uncommon. Um, the number does go up when there's a highly contested um, race on the ballot. Um, so especially governors, um, if governor is an open office and the um, current governor is not running, there's a lot of people that file. There's a lot of candidates and um, a lot of them just um, file. And so it's it's not, um, not uncommon. It's very common that we have quite a few candidates who don't meet qualifications. Um, and this is a regular process, especially when um, somebody um, like governor is on the ballot and it's not contested. Great. Um, I'm going to go to questions in the chat. Um, you can, of course, put questions in the chat or raise your hand and we'll do. I think we're doing three and three more or less has been our pattern here. Um, so this is a question from Sam Stites with OPB. Um, can your office provide a list of the 11 other candidates the elections division ruled were also ineligible um, because they are not readily available on Orstar? And we only throw, show three pending. So I, I'm certain the answer is yes. But does anyone else want to say anything about that? Go ahead, Lydia. I did not um, hear the beginning of the question. Are we, um, is the question about um, were can there- we, Can we provide the letters to the folks that have been disqualified already, the 11 other people? That is public record and we can definitely provide that. Great. Um, and folks can just follow up with me if they want that information um, over email. Um, here's another question from Gary. Um, he says, I am uh, with the EO Media Group. I am asking this because I know Kristoff will make the argument. Did Secretary Fagan's prior relationships with the Democratic Party and Speaker Kotek impact her decision? Again, as I said, my primary responsibility is to build trust with Oregonians. And the way that that was ha happened in this situation is by trusting the decision of the people that are on uh, the call with me today, our elections director, and again, Lydia told me yesterday it wasn't even a close call. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've certainly, I mean, I read the news, I've seen people saying that, and I just want to, you know, yes, I'm a, I'm an elected secretary of state. And I was the one of two major party nominees last, um, a year ago, November. But I am sure if you look closely, you will find that there are people supporting all of the different candidates for governor who also supported me, um, including the United Food and Commercial Workers, uh, one of the state's largest private sector employee unions, has been a supporter of mine um, for a long time. Uh, in fact, Mr. Kristoff's attorney, Misha Isaacs, is a friend of mine and donated to my campaign and not only just sent it in, he like wrote a nice little card when he, when he supported my campaign. So I'm a person of integrity and Oregonians can trust. Uh, that this is a process that was put through the professionals in the elections division who have the experience and the technical expertise to apply the qualifications to the law. Okay, not seeing any hands raised. I'm gonna um, keep doing questions from the chat. This one from Jim Redden, um, I believe with the Portland Tribune. Um, a Marion County Circuit Court judge ruled voting does not determine residence in 1974 in the 1974 case involving then state rep Bill Wyatt. How do you square that with your decision? Um, thanks, Jim. I appreciate you bringing this up because this was obviously a case uh, as soon as I think somebody reported it. I don't, you know, again, there's been a lot of uh, media interest and, and and a PR campaign, so I forget who exactly, but, um, but yeah, so the advice we've received is that's a very distinguishable case for one very important reason. I'm sure a number of them, but uh, the, in that instance, the person was registered to vote somewhere 
and then just simply didn't re-register, but didn't actually affirmatively vote or do anything affirmative in that time period. It's very different from Mr. Kristoff, who wasn't just registered in New York, but voted affirmatively in November of 2020 and had to be a resident of New York to vote. And I know that there's been a lot about New York law and multiple residences. I don't know, you know New York law. What I know is that New York law requires that you be qualified to vote, um, that he affirmatively asserted that he was qualified to vote by voting, and that Oregon statute provides directly that in ORS 247035, if I don't get that right, we can follow up with you, but it's something like that, um, that if a person casts a ballot in another state, they are no longer a resident of Oregon. It's very, very simple. So it's distinguishable from that Marion County case because that person was registered and just didn't simply update it, kind of a passive omission of action. Mr. Kristoff took action in November of 2020, consistent with his belief that he was a resident of New York. Great. Um, a question from the chat from Andrew Selsky with the Associated Press. Um, hello, Secretary Fagan. Could you have overruled the election officials' decision and decided that Kristoff is eligible to run? I assume so, but wanted to confirm. Would there have been a process for that? I, I don't know if there'd be a process for that. I never even asked that. I committed to Deborah and Lydia early that this was their decision and uh, and and went along the process with them. So I, I personally would not have overruled them. Again, my primary job as Secretary of State is to build trust with Oregonians, applying the same rules to everybody. I'm not going to overrule a decision when Lydia tells me that it wasn't even a close call. Great. And then I'm going to do this last one in the chat um, and then go over to where hands raised. Um, you can raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question um, without the chat. This from Gary Warner with EO Media. Um, oh, that's for me. Sorry. It says Molly, a side question. When does Betsy Johnson have to file her signatures to run in the general? What is the deadline? It's in August sometime. Is that correct? Elections? Yeah. OK, <laughs> cool. <laughs> cool. Um, let's see here. So now we're going to go back over to hands raised and uh, Dick Hughes. Um, you should be unmuted. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I, just a couple of things to make sure I'm understanding. Um, what did the DOJ say in their conversations? Uh, what was their legal advice to you? Um, and also in perusing the letter very quickly, and I may have gotten it wrong, but in perusing the letter to the Kristoff campaign, uh, you, you mentioned that he had not submitted uh, tax returns to you, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm trying to correlate that with the fact that you didn't specifically ask for tax returns and, and stuff. So those are my two questions. Right, well, I, um... I don't want to, I mean, the Department of Justice was giving us essentially the standard, like what is the legal standard for residency? Um, in 160 plus years of Oregon history, this is the first time that the definition of residency in Article 5, Section 2 is being interpreted um, in 27 pre previous secretaries that has not had to be interpreted, um, in part because it's not a high bar. The Constitution requires that somebody has to be 35 years old and a resident within the state for three years. To be uh, to constitutionally uh, qualify to serve as governor, and so uh, in terms of the Department of Justice, they are um, this decision again. I don't want to put words in their mouths, but there was not really there wasn't a dispute. This is a decision that they are fully prepared to discuss. It was really us asking questions procedurally, asking what the standard is, um, making so that Lydia knew what standard is she applying to then the documents and information that Mr. Kristoff provided. Um, but the the absence of a written opinion is only because we said we don't meet, they offered one and we said we need to get this going. We do not want to end up with a ballot that has to be printed on March 17th with Mr. Kristoff claiming he's supposed to be on there. We need to get this to the Oregon Supreme Court if he's going to to challenge it as quickly as possible. Great. Thank, um, thank you. And then um, should you have specifically asked for mm -hmm. tax records if 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 that's one of the things you mentioned he didn't provide that might have been supporting? I'm just trying to understand that. 
Yeah, I mean, Mr. Kristoff clearly has uh, prestigious and qualified counsel who provided a lot of different documents he claimed to file for Oregon taxes. If he challenged this decision, he's certainly welcome to, to give the court. Uh, but again, Lydia gave him the opportunity to provide anything, including, you know, things he provided that, that other people have not, that we, even new things in this case. So Lydia, I don't know if, I mean, her normal course is to not ask for specific documents, but Lydia, I don't know if you want to respond to Dick um, for that question. Yeah, we did ask for documents. We didn't specify documents, but we did ask for documents, any documents that would uh, prove that he lived here. And we received a memo, um, but no documents attached. Um, Yes, we didn't specify because we didn't know what he can. We didn't want to limit his um, um, things that he wanted to um, show to us. So we didn't limit him by specifically asking him for specific documents, but get, gave him the opportunity to provide any documents he can. And um, we, we received a memo that mentioned something, but no documents attached. Thank you very much. Great, and then we have a follow up question from Jen Redden, um, Madam Secretary, follow up um, uh, on the question around uh, Bill Wyatt. Wyatt actually voted in Lane County in 1972, according to a story in the October 2nd, 1974 issue of the Oregonian. Why did you say he didn't vote in Lane County? Um, I'm just gonna editorialize and say, I'm sure this is something we can follow up on if we got some of the details wrong, but do you wanna speak to that? Uh, my understanding was it was a question of whether he'd been a resident since 1974. Oh, sorry, for the 1974 appointment or election. And, and he had, if he had voted in 1972, that's two years, not one year. It's a one-year residency requirement for our state legislature, at least um, I believe it was. I don't, it's not a state legislative case, but that's my understanding, again. Um, but if, if we're wrong or if you want to follow up, I'm happy to do that. But that's my understanding, 1972, but it was a question of 1974 going backwards. Okay, great. Um, I am not seeing any questions, so this is your final warning to either um, reason. Secretary Hillary Boyd from Laragonian. I just had one quick question. Um, I don't believe this was in the elections division letter, but you had mentioned among the evidence that uh, Nick Kristoff wasn't considering himself an Oregon resident um, in recent decades, that he educated his children in New York State. Uh, do you believe, it sounded like you were asserting there that that's something to consider in terms of eligibility or whether a, a, a candidate for office is really a resident of Oregon, like where their children are going to school? Um, all factors about where someone actually lives. Again, voting is the strongest evidence. It creates kind of a presumption, as some of the cases have talked about. Um, it is not controlling in, in, you know, any particular factor is not controlling, but there's strong evidence. And so um, I believe that Mr. Kristoff noted that in his, one of his legal memos that his kids graduated from high school there. Um, it was simply one of the things that the folks that had objective evidence for that they noted that in and of itself is not a single factor. The one the courts have focused on the most um, is where somebody chooses to vote as a resident. Great, and we have another question from um, from Gabby Urenda. You should be unmuted. Uh, yeah, now I'm unmuted. I uh, got a last minute question from our producer, so thank you for taking the time to uh, answer this. So is Christoph the only person ever to get rejected because of residency? We wanted to make sure we got an answer on that. Thank you. I don't have that information. Um, sir, you mean the only for governor? Or other uh, uh, let, well, it's a question from someone else, but I want to say that's the assumption. Yes. OK, I mean, we can get back to you on that. Certainly our county elections officials are looking at residency for who's voting, you know, who's running for water board and school board and and mayor and, and all other kinds of elections. But Lydia, do you know off the top of your head or should we just get back to her? I can definitely get back um, to her with that question. I know for a fact that there are others who um, fail to be on the ballot because of residency um, question, but I have to check specifically if it was for governor. Great, and and I had said when we started, I apologize that if you were on the phone, you could kind of yell out your question. So if we've got any reporters um, uh, that have that are on the phone that want to ask a question, now would be the time to speak up. All 
Okay, Madam Secretary, any closing thoughts? No, thank you for all of your attention to this and I uh, appreciate the work that you do. Thanks everyone. I know a lot of you are asking for the recording. Um, we will get that out as soon as we can. Um, if you have follow up questions and you don't hear from me right away, please don't hesitate to reach out. I will be um, your contact on this uh, through at least Monday um, and you all should know how to find me by now. Thank you everyone. Thanks.